For the last thirty minutes, he had watched his gorgeous wife make her way through the ballroom so that at midnight when the ball dropped she would be as far away from her husband as possible. Surrounded by wealthy, smug peers, she would be spread like a plate of Olivia. Kissed and harassed by every executive where he worked and with special tenderness by his rich from birth, imbecilic boss. He knew this because his company's New Year's Eve party had gone like this for the past two years. The first year he'd put up with it, writing it off to too much champagne, last year, however, the horn had sounded too loud and he'd started making preparations. Feeling a tug on his coat, he turned to face Deirdre Josephine's best friend and co-conspirator. Happy New Year, Mike. She exclaimed reaching up to pull his head in for her annual pity kiss. He barely touched his lips to hers before he pulled away and looked into her brown eyes. Deirdre was another socialite. A trust fund baby like his wife from an even wealthier family than Joe's family. He expected to see the easy smirk she usually bestowed on him, explaining that she knew something he didn't because she was a pillar noblewoman like his wife and his boss. Instead, he saw two new emotions pity and concern. Mike, don't take this so seriously. She's just exchanging kisses and old New Year's tradition. She'll come back in a little while, no worse for wear and show you again how much she loves you. He looked at her skeptically. Deirdre tried to reassure him. She does love you, you know. It's just that she's very outgoing and lively and impulsive and you. You're intellectual and silent. Sometimes she needs a chance to be with others more like her, but spending time with them only makes her love for you stronger. Okay, Deirdre, is that why she spent the entire Christmas party in her company under the mistletoe with her co-workers? We go to her Christmas party and she spends the night dancing and making out with her firm's executives. And here at my firm's New Year's Eve ball, she spends the entire night dancing and kissing. No sucking with my firm's executives. So by making out with everyone at the party except me, she begins to appreciate me in a new way, that's an interesting concept. Tell me, is this another New Year's tradition of kissing George the Embassy a dozen times, or is it just her way of showing her love for me since she knows how much I hate that bitch? I had to hand it to Deirdre. She had enough self-control to be embarrassed. She couldn't take my stares, so she looked away and tried again. Mike, I can see how upset you are, but you have to understand. Don't you, Deirdre? I think I do. For the first time in our five years of marriage, I think I really understand. I turned my back to her. Walked back to our table, reached in and opened the briefcase I had placed under the table and extracted from it a rather large, brightly wrapped package. Standing with my back to her, I removed the ring from my finger and tied it in the middle of the bow she had to remove to open the package. Turning to Deirdre, I held out the package. I'm going to leave now. Please give this to your friend when or if she breaks free from the grip of the men surrounding her. Tell her I wish her a happy new year, and I hope she gets everything she deserves next year. I turned to leave, but Deirdre pulled me by the arm. Don't go, Mike. I'll go get her. She's had too much champagne again. You gotta take her home. No, Deirdre. I don't have to. She's got a room here at the hotel. She's been here all day entertaining the men while I've been working. Of course, you know all this because you've been here with her. She's got her own car, clothes, everything she needs. I'm sure at least one of the gentlemen she's making out with right now will be more than happy to make her happy, or maybe they all will don't look at me like that. You told me the same lie last year. I gave her this year to make up her mind. She has made up her mind and so have I goodbye, Deirdre. I can't help saying that it will be a relief to me never to see you again. As I left the ballroom, I nodded to Helen, the personnel director, with whom I had spent the first half of the day while my boss and his buddies helped set things up at the hotel. In reality, he was in a luxury suite which he had paid for with the company credit card, fucking my wife. Actually, I should have said they were in a luxury suite sleeping my wife. And I have the pictures and video to prove it. Helen has some too, and the chairman of the board will have it within minutes. After leaving the ballroom, Helen and her husband made their way toward the crowd of men around Josephine. 
Deirdre was making her way through the crowd of men, many of whom persisted in trying to kiss her in the grand tradition. A few men tried to hit on Helen, but they seemed to be deterred by the frown of her husband, a former forward in American soccer. She made her way through the crowd to CEO, George Burke, and his companion just ahead of Deirdre. She stopped her husband a few feet away from them and watched. Deirdre's confused look and the shrill cry of her name caught Joe's attention, and she broke off George's embrace. She frowned when she saw her friend's startled look. Helen smiled. Deirdre held out the gorgeously wrapped present and said something to Joe who took the package. Leaned closer and seemed to ask Deirdre to repeat herself. Mike left this for you. He's gone, Joe. He watched you flirt and make out all night, and when you started making out with all those men, he gave me that package and left. Joe smiled, oh, you know, Mike. He throws these little fits when I don't pay attention to him for a few minutes, I'll come home, apologize to him, fuck him like a fool, and everything will be fine he loves me. See, even when he's angry, he leaves my gift. Let's see what it is, Joe. I don't think it's a present. Deirdre began, but Joe was already busily untying the ribbon to open the package. As the ring fell to the ground, she paused, frowned, and asked, What's this? George bent down, picked it up, held it out to her and smirked. Isn't that your husband's wedding ring? She stopped tearing the paper, looked at him puzzled and took the ring. She looked at Deirdre who muttered. I tried to tell you. Joe started to tear the wrapping off the gift and found a white gift box inside, relieved she smiled, shook the box, said, it's heavy, and began to cut the tape on each side with her fingernail. When the tape on the third side ripped, the contents of the box fell out and scattered on the floor. She squatted down to pick up the fallen glossy sheets. Others squatted and picked up the ones that slid down beside them. Suddenly, everyone froze, Joe's eyes widened and she screamed. No. That shout caught the attention of those around them, and more people came into their circle. Deirdre's eyes widened incredulously too, she looked up and saw the look of horror on George's face. He picked up a glossy 20 by 30 centimeter color photograph from the ground that lay at his feet, pressed it against his expensive suit, and involuntarily shouted. What the fuck, Joe? Loud enough to be heard by everyone in the vicinity. Everyone looked at the pictures lying everywhere and saw Joe having sex with persons other than her husband. There were many pictures of Joe and George, as well as Joe with other executives at the firm where Mike worked with Joe's co-workers and bosses. They weren't enough to cover all the positions of the Kama Sutra but Mike had done a good job of selecting photos that proved Josephine didn't mind having vaginal, anal, or oral sex. With men, women, or toys and in any combination or quantity, faced with the photos of her sexual adventures, Joe fainted. She fell on her back and only George's slip-on shoe kept her head from hitting the tile floor and possibly giving her a concussion. Deirdre knelt down beside her, lifted her head, slapped her face lightly, and screamed frantically. Joe, Joe, you're all right, Joe. Talk to me, Joe. Are you okay? As both women lay on the floor, the others began to pick up the pictures and look at them. One woman turned around and hit her husband as hard as she could, as he looked down at the picture he was holding. You're a whore. No wonder you don't have the energy left to satisfy me. He stared at her in stunned silence until she swung her purse and punched him in the right eye. He clutched his eye screamed in pain, and then collapsed to the floor as she kicked him in the balls with her pointy-toed shoe. The woman knelt down and began methodically going through pictures on the floor. She paused, looked up and stated, you bitches who are married to the management of Taylor and Son, might want to take some of these photos and check them out. There are pictures of other husbands in here too, if you want to save money on a divorce attorney, give me a call, and I'll see if I can find us a group rate. Nine other women kneeled down and started looking at the photos and the men started backing away. There are flash drives in here too. One of them announced loudly. There's no telling what's on them, you lousy cheater. Yelled at the well-dressed older man. Remember our prenup? You broke you bastard, baby, I'm sorry. 
It didn't mean anything. She kept hitting on me and eventually I gave in, but it was only once, and she wasn't as good as you anyway, and you lying liar. The blonde shouted. Holding out two more pictures, the blonde got up off the floor and went at him with murder in her eyes waving the pictures around and swearing at him. Profuse he stepped back, then turned and ran away. The other woman sobbed, clutching one hand to her chest and waving a photograph in the other, her husband, hiding his face in his hands was sobbing too. The man pulled out the photo holding it up to the gorgeous woman standing in front of him and said loudly, so you're by. What the hell is this? You kept telling me I'd never get a threesome because you'd never be with a woman, she blushed, turned, and ran off. Wobbling in her ten-inch heels, another woman picked a half dozen photos from the pile and was calling out names as she walked toward the center of the ballroom. The puzzled woman stopped her, picked up a photo, stared at it, and turned to her husband with a look of murder on her face. He began to back away and she trotted toward him waving the photograph. This scene was repeated five more times and each time, the victim's companions were struck in the ears and eyes. Asterisk 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 Joe had already woken up and was looking at what was happening around her with lazed eyes, a man in an expensive tuxedo knelt down beside her. He asked, are you okay? She looked at him curiously and nodded. He asked, who are you? Can I help you? I'm Josephine Lord, she replied grimly, but I don't think anyone can help me now. Are you Josephine Reynolds Lord? He asked incredulously. She nodded and asked, I am. And who are you? The man handed her the stack of papers he was carrying, snapped a picture of her with his phone and announced loudly, I am the bailiff. You have been served Josephine Reynolds Lord. These documents and the accompanying photographs and videos prove the adultery alleged in Michael Morris Lord's divorce petition. He turned to the large group. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't had time to look at the photos, just order a copy of the divorce papers which are public records available online. It lists the names of all the people Joe SWB has had sex with in the last year, along with where and when. For a nominal fee, I can provide a link to Joe SHB's website that fully describes her exploits since January 1st last year. If you would like to review these to determine if your husband or wife has been involved in a steamy three-way, four-way, or more sexual relationship with SHB, you can contact me online at cheatingspousebeat.com, and for a nominal fee, a link to her site will be provided. For an additional fee, I can provide digital copies of the participants' actions. You will find such evidence very useful in court. I look forward to hearing from you." He bowed deeply and walked away, leaving tears, fear, and panic behind him. Hell would apparently be waiting for him for this stunt. But he was very, very well paid for it. Besides this was New York and his office was in New Jersey, where his family was very influential. Joe was still holding the divorce papers in her lap, reclining in her friend's arms, her mouth open in bewilderment. She looked at the faces gathered around her and saw hatred pity, anger, and anxiety. The inevitable admiration, lust, and envy she had known all her privileged life was completely absent, and the enormity of her loss and shame was finally apparent. She clung to Deirdre again and buried her face in her friend's chest sobbing inconsolably. George Taylor ordered his minions to pick up those damn pictures and burn them. Looking directly at Helen, he ordered, I want a letter of to Mike Lord on my desk on Monday with the dismissal papers underneath. With a neutral expression on her face, Helen stated I'm sorry, Mr. Taylor, but Mr. Lord resigned this afternoon. He gave two weeks notice. Use the vacation you signed last week, took all his supplies and materials and left the building. I will not accept his resignation, I will fire him after reprimanding him. He will never work in this business again. Sorry again, Mr. Taylor, but he met with the chairman of the board before he left and your father accepted his resignation. Mr. Lord already has another job with one of the firms he consulted with with your written permission, sir. Taylor's face was so red that listeners and onlookers feared he was going to have a stroke as he muttered loud curses at his father and Mike Lord. 
Helen and her husband watched his embarrassment with glee clasping each other's hands in delight. Naturally maintaining a neutral expression. Mike Lord was driving from New York in a brand new four-wheel drive Chevy High Country Suburban with a 62-liter turbo diesel engine ordered over and above the standard equipment. He had specifically ordered the SUV in fall as soon as the new models became available, and he had it delivered yesterday. The navigator said it would take 24 hours 32 minutes to get to his new home in Austin, Texas on the route he had chosen. He knew it would actually take the better part of a week because the country boy from Idaho was going to absorb the of the rural states he was about to drive through. Once he got to Virginia, he intended to forego the main highways, take the country roads that John Denver sang about, and visit the small towns in the Carolinas that Mary Shaw Carpenter sang about. He was going to taste the homemade jellies and jams sold at roadside stands and small local stores and eat where the locals ate away from the highways and the rushing bustling people and the lifestyle he had grown to hate. Their checking and savings accounts were separate, but not until after he bought his SUV, since she had earned ten times as much throughout their marriage, an $88,000 car would do little to even the score but he was happy to use at least some of her money to buy it. Under the terms he'd offered, he would keep his investments in retirement funds, and she would keep hers. He'd leave her the penthouse and no claim on her trust fund if she accepted his generous terms and signed the divorce papers within 10 days. The radio was tuned to Sirius XM's best traditional country music station, The Roadhouse. Joe hated country music almost as much as he hated retro music. So the next station would be classic vinyl. He was his own man now, not the ignorant cuckold she'd made him out to be for at least two years. He'd taken his life into his own hands when the New Year's ball dropped last year, and had spent the entire year getting his thoughts together. Perhaps Taylor and Son would survive his departure, but he highly doubted it. Operating under George's inept leadership and stripped of the many design improvements in patents, Mike had brought to the company over the past five years, he expected it to collapse within a year or two. He smiled at the thought, knowing that his work had generated over half of the new sales and profits in the previous year and that he had the best designs and design improvements ready to go as soon as his new company could get up and running. Oh, his old boss. The current chairman of the board and George's dad Randolph Taylor would probably sell the business before it collapsed. But George would be exposed as the inept charlatan he was before that happened, the thought of that made him smile. Tonight, he had made George and his own horror wife look like immoral and unprincipled. Institute as a businessman when his new company would crush his old one like a bug that had just been smeared on the windshield, thinking about it made him smile. He wouldn't mind being a bug on the wall witnessing when Josephine's parents found out about his antics at the ball. Helen had already called him to tell him how wonderful everything had turned out. The fact that she had scattered the pictures all over the ballroom was beyond his wildest dreams, even though he had purposely made the box so that it would fall apart when the film was cut on three sides. Her parents had looked down on him from the beginning and were made when their precious perfect daughter decided to marry him. After all, he didn't even have an Ivy League education. The fact that an engineering degree from the Colorado School of Mines and a master's degree from the University of Michigan made him highly sought after in his field meant nothing. Better a liberal arts education at Brown than such a mediocre pedigree. He smiled thinking of the destruction he had wrought and what he would produce in the future. Deirdre and her husband Albert drove Josephine home. As soon as they entered the house and she looked around, Joe began to sob again. On the way home, she rehearsed her speech to Mike, she had to explain that her affairs meant nothing to her and were not hurting their marriage. It was just a vacation or an attempt to influence decisions that concerned her and their lives better. Recreational sex only helped them, she explained. It brought her libido back under control when it raged and she learned things she used to pleasure her husband to diversify their love life. It sounded ridiculous even to herself, and she knew Mike wouldn't buy it. Truth be told, he was a real stickler for marriage vows. 
Even talk of swapping partners or role-playing with others infuriated him. Why then, did she think he'd buy the crap she was going to sell him? Deep down, she knew her marriage was burnt out. But when she walked into their apartment and found all stuff gone, she realized she'd fallen into a hole she dug herself. She sank to the floor, crying bitter tears, and cursing her own arrogance. She had no ready explanation for her actions because she never believed she would be caught. And if she was, she would convince her sweet naive husband to forgive her. For three years, she had been successful. And tonight, he burned both her marriage and her reputation to the ground. The week went by quickly for Mike. He cloned his SIM card before tossing the old one into the dirty city snow so he could initiate contact, but no one could interrupt his journey through the Old South to his new home in Texas. The emails he customized were sent out all week. Spouse after spouse received an individual email with an attachment and marriage after marriage was burned out. The thought of this result brought a smile to Mike's face. The letter to Deirdre's husband had been mailed yesterday. Thinking about Al's response made Mike smile broadly. Joe was responsible for her own actions, but Deirdre's account of the pleasure of her personal experience as a slut her friends and trees to share the joy by spreading her legs had really influenced Joe's decision. It was day four, and back in New York, Deirdre and Joe were sitting on the couch in their apartment. It was now their apartment because Al had kicked Deirdre out after receiving an email and watching a video. It contained five snippets of sexual activity and an enlightening conversation with Joe in which they described their conquests and pleasures and listed their lovers by name, occasionally laughing at their clueless husbands. Albert forwarded copies of this conversation to each of the wives of the named women if he knew them. And he knew most of them. The fire was spreading, and Albert smiled as he watched the flames. Things were no better for George. His father had fired him and disinherited him. In fact, he had fired all the senior executives who were responsible for the firm getting a black mark because of their actions and was acting CEO while his new VP of Talent Development and Attraction, Helen recruited top executives from all over the world. Mike passed the Martin Luther King Boulevard exit and prepared to turn onto Cesar Chavez Street. As he drove past the Austin Convention Center, he saw Lady Bird Lake on his left crossed Congress Avenue and pulled up to the exclusive high-rise apartment his new company was providing at 70 Rainy. The rent on the apartment was paid six months in advance giving him time to find the house with the treaties and lawn he'd longed for. Once he was settled, he would buy a dog and start looking for a new companion who would be reliable and who would enjoy setting up house for him and their children. His new partners have already planned a barbecue at which they will introduce him as recently divorced and promise there will be plenty of eligible women there. Meanwhile, in New York City, the fire continued to rage with exposed spouses throwing others under the bus and abusive spouses sharing what they knew about other abusive spouses. Helen kept Mike in the loop. He contemplated the ever-expanding flames of the great New York fire he had lit and smiled. The more he heard, the more excited he became that he was GTT, gone to Texas, gone to Texas.